Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Don't you just hate it when the stuff that um, you think God wants to say to everybody else, he's talking to you about? <laughs> ah. And, you know... When you're sitting there thinking, I hope that person's listening. <laughs> and actually God's saying to you, I hope you're listening. Um, anyway, that's what happened to me during worship this morning. So God was busy um, doing my sermon on me. So thank you, God, I think. Um, what, what do you need changed in your life? I just want to ask you to think for a minute. What needs to change in your life? What would your husband or wife say needs to change in your life? What would your children say needs to change in your life? What would your work colleagues or your boss And if you're really honest, what would you want to, to be able to see transformed in your life? We've been um, looking in Isaiah 55, which, which is God's invitation to Israel to change. And I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to dive, well, it's... We've been diving into the passage in little chunks and we will go back to that. But I felt like today God wanted to kind of step back out and take an overview of transformation. What, how does God change us? If we're wanting to partner with God to see something change in our lives, how does God do that? Because actually he said that his ways are different to ours. And how God changes stuff is different to how we would go about changing stuff. We would get a self-help book or do more or try harder or just forget about it because change is too hard and say, well, you know, I've tried that, doesn't work. What really actually needs to change in your life and in my life, because change is, transformation is ongoing. None of us ever arrive. Um, so I'm, I'm going to explore that this morning from this passage in Isaiah 55. And I just thought I will read it um, through. And then I just want to actually put some little steps in. Um, hopefully it'll be helpful. This is what God was inviting Israel to in their journey of transformation. And I, I'm just reading it each time because I want us to get familiar with the, the flow of transformation. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. What a fantastic invitation. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that doesn't give you strength or pay for food that, doesn't, that does you no good? Listen, listen to me, says God, and you'll eat what's good and you'll enjoy the finest of food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. I'll give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the peoples? I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know and peoples unknown will come running to obey because I, the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, I've made you glorious. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he's near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. And this is the passage that kind of has prompted these thoughts this morning. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. 
So what's it like to actually find ourselves empowered to change something in our lives, some area of our lives? Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a attitude. Maybe it's something that's always been part of our life and we've realised that it's destructive. Maybe it's a way that we do relationships. I've thought about it for my life and one of the things that um, I've grown up with and was probably a family attribute, pretty ugly one, was a feeling of being superior. Do I want to go through life thinking and treating people like I'm better than them? I don't want to do that. So it's an area that I've invited God to do this journey of transformation with. Have I arrived? No, I haven't. But I don't want to carry that stuff. What don't you want to carry? Who don't you want to be? Because God's in the business of inviting us to transformation. Some of you are fearful and you've lived with fear all your life and God's saying you don't have to carry fear. Some of you are passive and you just let things happen around you. And God's saying you don't have to live with passivity. What is it that you don't want to live with anymore? Because God loves empowering us to change. Okay, here we go. The first, um, the first place that we all kind of launch from, I've called My Life, My Way. And it's that sense of... Um, don't tell me what to do, I'm okay, uh, I don't need to change anything, thanks all the same, I'll just, you know, I'll live, I'll make choices, I'll do whatever I want to do. Um, most of us are born with that sort of attitude. Hello, anybody else born with that attitude? I was, I had two older sisters, so I had three mothers. <laughs> and you know when you have three mothers? All you want to do is do your own thing. Don't tell me what to do. Um, the classic was, um, as I grew up, my sisters tell me, my, my favourite saying was, I can do it by myself. You know, I don't want you to tell me what to do. I don't want to have to be accountable to anybody, thank you. And we do my life my way, quite happily, until... It doesn't work. And we get to a point where we realise, actually, my life, my way, for some reason, maybe I've stuffed up my relationships, maybe I've um, made some really bad choices, maybe I've found myself addicted to something or just in a mess, and somewhere in our life we actually get to the point where um, Isaiah calls it thirsty, or God calls it thirsty, I actually recognise um, something is wrong and I can't fix it. Um, so we move out of that sort of independence and out of that human wisdom and we come to that place where we actually have to honestly acknowledge I've, I've messed up, I've stuffed up, I can't do this myself, I need God. And we actually... That's a scary place to come to where we actually realise that we do need God. We have to acknowledge that we have um, failed. We've come to the end of our own ability um, to sort our own life out. Um, it's a scary place because it requires us to be brutally honest. And honesty at this stage, when we're feeling like a failure, is really scary. Because the enemy wants to take that sense of failure and turn it back down on itself and cause us to go into, um, self dis uh, into, into despair, into self-destruction, into eventually into death. Like, think of the suicide rate that's current in our nation, where people get to the end of themselves, but they actually have no... Um, they, 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 they choose not to call on God they actually end up feeling like that things are so hopeless, so discouraging, so uh, out of control that they go into self-destruction. Now, self-destruction can look at all sorts of things. It can look like addiction. 
It can look like, um, yeah, like self-harm. It can look like all, all sorts of things, but it, it actually takes us away from God. It doesn't take us towards God. The enemy's plan for us is to be so brutally honest, so aware of our brokenness and failure that we go into, I'm hopeless, I'm terrible, I'm a waste of space. Anybody ever felt like that? I'm the only person who's ever felt... No? Some of you have felt like that. And that is exactly the plan of the enemy. Because he takes this very place that we need to get, which is thirsty, and he perverts it into hopelessness and self-destruction. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is transformation. And the next invitation for us is to actually come to God. Um, to call, as Isaiah says, call on my name. So I'm going to run out of room here, but you'll just have to... Can you see that? Okay. To call on God's name. We realise that we... Um, oh, man. It's too much to share here. Like... One of the things that we realise when we actually call on God's name is we've actually put our hope in something that was false. Like the prophet says, why, why are you eating from stuff that doesn't satisfy you? How many times have we put our hope, oh, if I, if I could just have this relationship, my life would be fine. If I could just get this job, if I could just, if I could just, and we find ourselves because we actually put things and people in the place of God. It's called idolatry. Um, but I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched somebody um, choose a relationship over God. Do you, know, do you know what happens when you choose a relationship in disobedience to God? You know what happens? That person has to become God to you. And no human being can be God to you. And so you end up disappointed, you end up frustrated. And you know, maybe it might be a few years into the relationship, you find, man, this did not work out like I thought it was going to. And we find ourselves disillusioned and disappointed. In this place of calling on God, we actually realise, oh God, I, I really messed up. I put my hope in this job, in this person, in this whatever, and I actually found myself um, going for stuff that's not satisfying, eating bread that doesn't work. Okay. In this place where we call on God, we find that he comes and meets us. He becomes our strength, our comfort, our help. He describes his unfailing love to us and we kind of realise, oh, God loves me even though I'm stuffed up, even though I am broken, God does love me. And he actually has a plan for my life and we start to feel a little bit hopeful. And right there, there is this really, really clever thing that the enemy does. He actually says, okay, well... Yeah, I couldn't stop you from being honest about the place that you got to and I couldn't stop you calling on God's name. But what I'd really like you to do is I would like you to come back as soon as God's done something and fixed some stuff up in your life, come back to living God your way, your life, your way. Okay, don't actually progress any further in your, um, in your transformation. I, I, how many times do we find that, that cycle going on in our lives? Oh, we call on God, yes, God comes through, and then we go back to living our way and as if, you know, until the next time we have a crisis and then we go back to God and then we... And, and the enemy, he's okay with that. If you're going to call on God, he's probably okay with that too as long as you go back to living your life your way um, after, you know, after God's been kind to you for a, a little while. You see, the enemy wants us to stumble over letting God be God. This way, when we only 
do this cycle, what we have is almost like God in our pocket. So we have him there when something goes wrong. Oh, I'll pull him out, have him as my trump card, and once he's fixed everything up, I'll go back to living how I, I wanted to live. And so God ends up serving us. And he is our, um, you know, he's our get out of jail free card or our rescue or whatever. But God, we come to God on our terms or else not at all. We use him as a crutch when we're desperate. And actually the other thing that happens when we're in this space is that God has to answer to us. So if anything doesn't go right, we find ourselves saying, God, why did you let that happen for? Or why didn't you answer that prayer? Or why did you let this happen in the world? And we try and make God answer to us. How many times have you heard, how many times have you found yourself doing that? How many times have we heard other people doing it? How come God let this happen? How come God didn't do that? And so we blame, we accuse, we point the finger, and God somehow has to answer to us as if we are God and he's the creature. Talk about back to front and upside down. But that's how it ends up. For, because there is this massive kind of um, challenge that stops us going any further in our journey of transformation. And I'm going to call it the yes of repentance. and belief. We actually have to get to the point where we're willing to let God be God and let God um, choose uh, what, who he is and who he wants to be to us. So I'm calling this the coming to genuinely come and listen to God. The invitation in Isaiah is come to me, listen, listen to me with your ears wide open. This is not God on our terms for our sake. This is actually beginning to listen to God for his sake because he's God and he deserves to be listened to. Wow, it's actually humbly acknowledging him as our creator uh, and submitting to, our, to his loving rule. This is the killer. This is, this is right back to the garden, guys. This is letting God define good and evil. We have so wanted to, in our own human wisdom, we've thought we actually know better than God, so we'll have our own definition of what's acceptable and what's not, what's sin and what's not. Thanks very much. Right back to the garden. But in this place of surrender, we actually let God be the one who decides good and evil. And we trust his goodness, even when we don't understand and we can't explain. This is the root. You know, I love that Michelle chose those songs this morning. The goodness of God. Um, you know, will we, will we be able to trust His goodness when we don't understand and we can't explain? The enemy's plan at this point is to help us, like to to block us right here because he wants us to stumble over our pride, our human wisdom. Our offence? How come God calls that sin? That doesn't seem like a bad sin. I'm going to get offended at God for that. Um, deception? Well, obviously I know better than God, you know. Uh, rebellion? Don't tell me what to do. Like, nobody likes being told what to do. I don't know, maybe some people do. I don't like being told what to do. Independence? Lawlessness? It's all the stuff that God points out in Romans 1. And I put Romans 1 up there because I just thought it's offensive. When we read this from human wisdom, you will get offended. Just me reading the word of God. Just watch your heart as I read this and, and see if you think, oh, that's uncomfortable. How, how is it that God says that through the Apostle Paul? God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. Ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. 
They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshipping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. They worshipped and served the things that God created, including people, um, instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That's why God abandoned them to shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men and as a result of this sin they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things they should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarrelling, deception, malicious behaviour and gossip. Boy, is that, do you recognise some of these things in our world? Boy, they're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful, invent new ways of sinning, they disobey their parents, they refuse to understand, they break their promises, they're heartless, they have no mercy, they know God's justice required, requires that those who deserve do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway, and worse yet, they encourage others to do them. Is that a description of how hard it is to move beyond our human wisdom? That's hard to listen to. That's hard to let God define what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. It's hard in our modern world, isn't it? Like it's something really uncomfortable about that. So we've actually got a, a major kind of challenge to go beyond the God that we feel comfortable with into the place where we genuinely come to God, listen to him and let God be God. And we're nearly done. Thanks for listening. So there is listening, there's coming uh, and there is actually listening. How are we going? Oh, I was going to give you a minute to chat because you've been sitting there for a minute for a while. Why is offence with God and or other Christians such a powerful tool of the enemy in disrupting our transformation? You find an offended person and you will find a person whose transformation has stalled. I'll guarantee it. So take a minute and chat with somebody Around you, why does offence with God and with other Christians become such a powerful tool uh, for disrupting our transformation? Take them in and have a chat. Okay, two more, two more, not stages really, but two more aspects of transformation. I've managed to muddle myself up. My life, my way, recognising we have a need, coming to God, calling on his name, going to that genuine place of listening to God and actually being willing to do things his way. The next thing is actually turning from wrong. We own our sin. We welcome correction. Man, who likes being corrected? That is so uncomfortable, isn't it? 
But we welcome correction from the Holy Spirit. We welcome correction from our brothers and sisters in Christ because they, we know they love us. Oh, that's got to be supernatural when you welcome correction. Receiving mercy, forgiveness and cleansing. You know, that's that verse that says our God will freely pardon. That's such good news. I love that God pardons when we confess our sin. He's faithful and just and forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We begin to live free from accusation and condemnation. Do you know how good it is to not feel guilty? Who, who knows what it is to not feel guilty? Who lives not guilty? That's what the, it's such good news. That's what the gospel is. I'm forgiven. I'm free. I'm, I am so not perfect, but I'm forgiven. And I'm pardoned and I'm cleansed and I don't go in that big cycle of, oh, I'm such a terrible person. Like, that's, that's the good news. That's what Jesus died for. So that we could be forgiven, we can live free of accusation and condemnation. And when the enemy comes and he points the finger and says, you know, you failed, you did this, I say, yeah, I know, and I'm forgiven. <laughs> the enemy's plan is false guilt and, for, and shame. You know, you're a hopeless person. You should be this. You can't do this. You're not enough. I'm not enough, but Jesus in me is enough. Good news, good news. And the last one. We come to a place where we actually trust God. We trust God to be God and we obey him because we trust him. You can't obey anyone you don't trust. You just can't. But we actually come to know him. We know his character. We know who he is, what he's like. And we actually get to the point where we're willing to trust him. We actually find ourselves able to live in daily obedience um, to his word, uh, his spirit and his promises. And we have the ability to start to think like God. My ways aren't your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. And we begin to think um, the ways of God. We realise, ah, oh, sin is so dumb. It's like, yeah, what does Graham Cook say? It's like putting your hand in a meat grinder or a blender. Like, sin is... It's just, it, it hurts you, it hurts other people. Why would I do that? Why would I choose not to do things God way, God's way? And we begin to partner with God in his fruitfulness and we go on to that that's next week um, and we actually find ourselves transformed and fruitful in the way that we live. We go out with joy and we're led forth with peace and we find ourselves able um, to overcome the things that used to overcome us. So in this side, we actually find ourselves that God, we let God be God. We actually let his definition of right and wrong defend, define our choices and we answer to him. He doesn't answer to us, we answer to him. He's our loving Heavenly Father. Uh, we live knowing that we're loved and we choose to trust and obey. That's the life that we're invited into. Man, that's a life that's been transformed. And so, yeah, just to kind of sum it up, that's what, from Isaiah 55, I feel like that's the transformation journey. That thirst to abandon, well, it's my life, I'll do whatever I want, to actually come to realise our need, to come to God, to listen to him for his sake, to turn from evil and to trust and obey. One of the beautiful things about worship is it's not for our sake, it's actually for God's sake. And we're so selfish in our orientation as humans, we, we struggle to do anything that's not about us. <laughs> Worship is about God. And if you struggle to worship, I want to challenge you. Not if you struggle to sing, because it's not about that, but if you struggle to do something that's for God's benefit, not for yours, and you know, we all do, it's, it's like, that's because we're still in this cycle of what's in it for me. 
I'm going to pray for us because we need God's help. <laughs> Father, I am so grateful that you do not leave me where I am. And for each of us, thank you that you've invited us to be transformed. You've invited us to go on this journey with you. And Father, whatever area of our life where you're, you're highlighting, would you, in your kindness, help us to move beyond having you in our pocket and help us to come to that place where we let you be God. We choose, like Jesus, to bring ourselves into submission to you. Jesus, you said you only do what you see the Father doing. You lived a life of genuine submission. And we want you to teach us and empower us to truly live submitted to you, obedient and trusting so that your spirit has full access to change us, to be like Jesus. Come Holy Spirit. I'm just going to invite you to take a moment and just give to God whatever area that you would recognize needs transformation in your life. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a tendency to judge people. Maybe it's needing to be in control. Father, whatever area you're speaking to us in, we just say yes to you and yes to your ways. Amen.